as a disclaimer, everything that my guests and I say are individual opinions and do not represent the opinions of the Marine Corps and the Department of Defense. Now let's jump into the episode. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. Um, so this month I'm doing a little bit of a, a special. So um, as many of you know, April is the month of the military child. And today I'm interviewing a military child who is passionate about telling and sharing the stories of military families um, with a focus on military children. She is a host of a wonderful podcast, Grace of a Military Child and Life. Um, and you can listen to her on Spotify, Apple. Basically, she's everywhere. This lady is fabulous. Gracie, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you today. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor. Awesome. So yeah, I'm I'm a little bit nervous because like you are just killing it with your podcasting. So <laughs> I'm trying oh to like <laughs> stay on your level here. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that means a lot to me. Uh, I would not feel that way, but <laughs> it takes someone to tell it to me to know that I'm actually that way. But I feel like no, I don't yeah. have the experience of these people like, you know, Seth Rogen or these other big names who are out there podcasting. Right. But like for being so young, like you were, you were absolutely killing it. So yeah. Um Thank if you, you don't follow her already, like I promise you, follow her on Instagram, and we'll talk about that in the end. But um, yeah, let's let's just kind of dive in here. Um, Gracie, yeah. you know, tell us your name, tell us what you do, how old you are, if you don't mind sharing that, and where you yeah. live right now. So my name is Gracie Burgess. I am, um, like Serena mentioned, a U.S. Army brat. Um, I am all over the place. I do so much. Um, I am currently a graduate student at the University of Alabama pursuing a dual master's degree, the first one which I'll graduate with on May 4th of 2024 um, is a master's of science in marketing with a concentration in digital and social media. And then the following degree um, with an unknown end dates is journalism and media studies. So both of those degrees going on. I'm a social media contractor. I obviously run the podcast as well. I live in Cape Coral, Florida, um, but I am hoping to be moving at some point soon. Um, and yeah, I turn 22 next month or this month in April. So super excited. Nice. Awesome. Okay. So um, you mentioned you are an army brat. So can you, can you talk about exactly like what you identify with as being a military child? Like, Yeah. So my story of being a military brat is kind of all over the place. So I think that's like a, the best place to start with. Um, my dad was joined the army right after college. He went active duty. He served, um, you know, in various capacities with the MP, EMT, um, that kind of field. And then he spent time in Germany and he ended up coming back to the States and going reserve. So he switched to reserve. He worked in downtown Cleveland where he met my mom. And then they were my mom was pregnant with me and 9-11 happened. They were four wow. days away from getting married. And so my dad went on 30-minute recall orders pretty much immediately. Um, his unit called him in and was like, let's go. Like, um, And my mom, she said she just kind of was trying to drag into the courthouse saying like, no, we need to go get married now in case something happens. Like we're four days right. away. Like we need to do this now. Um, my dad was like, no, like we're going to be fine. We can't do this. Like I have to go. And so he ended up going. And then the wedding did happen four days mm -hmm. later as planned. Um, and two weeks later, my dad was stateside deployed to backfill for a unit who deployed overseas. So, um, like I said, he was an MP at the time. He backfilled for a unit, was fortunate enough um, because he was stateside. He was able to come home for my birth um, very easily. And so he came home, spent a couple weeks. Um, again, because he was stateside, my mom and I were able to visit him. So 
you know, we, I have a little scrapbook. That's one of my favorites to look at. And it's just like my little first plane ride. And I hadn't been on a plane ride between <laughs> that moment in my life and the time I was nine years old, um, okay. which will come later in the story. But, um, you know, I hadn't been on a plane ride throughout my entire childhood. So I always loved looking at that and saying, hey, I had been on a plane before. Um, but besides the point, um, you know, so that happened. And then my dad came home. My mom was expecting my younger sister. And then he deployed again. And again, he was able to come home for her birth. Thankfully, he was stateside deployed again. Um, And then he ended up with a knee injury. His time was like, there was something up with his time and service and stuff. And they were like, okay, well, you can like get out right now and just medically discharge. Or you can stay in and his unit was deploying to Iraq. So they were like, you can stay in, have your surgery. It was quite a big recovery. So stay in, have your surgery, recover, and then catch up with your unit. And he was like, well, I literally got married, had two kids in two years, basically have been on two deployments. Like I haven't spent time with my wife or children you know, this is, this is my time to do so. So he got out during his, um, during those seven years where he had a break in service, he, uh, worked for the Cuyahoga County Sheriff's Department as a corrections officer, part of the special response team. So, you know, a very similar life in a sense to what he was living in the military. And then, he missed the military life so much. He was like, I just miss that. I miss that brotherhood, that connection I have with my other service members, the, you know, the, the family that I've literally created within the military. And he decided to join back in. We kind of always joke about it now because my mom said, you can go back in, but you're bringing back that retirement. (laughs) And so (laughs) he did bring back that retirement, but in a different way. And so and that was about 2010, uh, February 2010, I believe, is when he re-enlisted. And so he re-enlisted. Uh, he re- re-enlisted as a psychological operations soldier, um, again, in the reserves. Mm-hmm. And so we were still in Cleveland, Ohio. We didn't have to move. The unit was only 45 minutes away. And then he w- ended up deploying in August of 2011. Mm-hmm. However... Mm-hmm was a very short-lived deployment. Mm -hmm. And so November 20th came around, and I'm going to tell it kind of from my perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, And I remember we're walking up and down the aisles in Sam's Club. We're literally getting ready to put a care package together to send overseas. We had just spent hours upon hours making Christmas cookies with a friend who's – at the time, her fiance was deployed as well. So we just spent hours upon hours making these Christmas cookies, like preparing a care package. We were walking around Sam's Club, walking up and down the halls. The next moments are kind of a blur for me. But then I remember we're at home, we're unloading the van with all of the groceries and my mom gets a phone call and she just hits her knees crying. And she keeps just saying, tell me my husband's alive. Tell me my husband's alive. Tell me my husband's alive. And like, I still get teary eyed, you know, 14 years or almost uh, 13 years later. Um, And so that whole thing of like her just sitting on the floor, you know, sobbing, screaming, you know, I was nine at the time. I feel that's, (laughs) that's probably an important detail to add. Um, But nine years old, you know, seeing that, um, unfold I was the oldest and so she hands me her cell phone she says go call Lina tell her something happened to daddy and her and Joey need to get over here right now Mm -hmm. and I didn't know what happened um all I knew is I had to go make this phone call um and so I go I make the phone call the only thing that I kind of had heard um I'm I've always been very observant and so you, you don't necessarily have to tell me something for me to know what's happening. Um, and so I was like, the only thing I could grasp is it's something with his legs. Mm. And I vaguely remember um, hearing the word amputee, hearing that mm. come out of my mom's mouth. But I also didn't, quote unquote, know what that word meant. Okay. The last movie that we saw as a family 
so ironic, um, Dolphin Tale. Mm. And so um, that was the last movie we saw as a family. Dad got a four-day pass to come home before his deployment. And my sister, she was obsessed with dolphins. And so, um, you know, that was kind of the, I should know what the word amputee means. I should yeah. know what it is. But, you know, here's my brain protecting me. Right. Um, and what I'm hearing and what I'm going through. So that situation unfolds. My sister and I went and stayed with um, a friend who was actually my sister's kindergarten and first grade teacher. We became really good friends. And if there was ever something that happened, that was the plan. My mom necessarily didn't necessarily want my sister and I to be in there um, in the house when everything was happening, Mm -hmm. especially with the chaos she wanted she knew my anxiety would start to spiral. She knew my sister would kind of start to get anxious and nervous and wondering what's happening. And because we're so young, she was like, let's just remove them from the situation and kind of deal with everything at home and then, you know, bring them back in. So mm-hmm. we kind of dealt with everything. Um, my sister and I went to school on a daily basis, uh, kept our routine that we were having. And then uh it was about so this all happened on a sunday mm-hmm. and then on thursday was thanksgiving oh, so the man. question in the air was are we you know my sister oh. and i were like we want to go to mom's for thanksgiving we want to see mom like when are we going to see mom again and you know they just kept telling us uh you know, you might be going to mom's, you might be going to my mom's house. Um, So there were quite a few options in there, but we were very excited to go back to mom's house. Um, So we went back home for Thanksgiving and that's when she sat us both down and um, she couldn't figure out how to tell us. Um, Cause how do you tell an eight and nine year old, you know? Um, and really the, yeah. the major injury my dad did sustain was an amputation of his right leg. Um, his left leg is a complete skin graft. They call it a degloving because it's like taking the glove off. So all the skin, muscle tissue, um, nerves, uh, arteries, all of that good stuff on the inside of his left leg um, was completely degloved. And so um, she sits us both down and uh, – she looks at us and she goes, something happened to daddy. Um, she goes, he stepped on a bomb. Um, but you know how Winter in Dolphin Tail lost her tail? Well, daddy lost his leg. And she couldn't figure out how to tell us, but she was on the phone with my dad one day. And he goes, if a dolphin can do it, I can do it. And, you know, he's like... He doesn't even remember saying that. He had so many medications in him. (laughs) But he said, if a dolphin can do it, I can do it. And Mm -hmm. that's how she told us. And, you know, we kind of just, um, we cried for a little while, obviously. Mm -hmm. And then we laughed it off. We had some other very supportive friends with us in the room at the time. And they were like, oh, my gosh, I'll get a flipper now. And you know, <laughs> so kind of cracking jokes about it, making light yeah. of the situation, which I feel in the military, really, as long as you can kind of make a joke out of it, <laughs> it's going to be better. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that was that. It was about a month later than um, my mom pretty much immediately flew to San Antonio to be with my dad and my sister and I hung back, um, stayed with our military family. Um, in Ohio. And then about a month later, right before Christmas, we flew down so we could spend Christmas as a family. And Mm then um, that was my sister and I's move down to Texas too. So, uh, and then he had about a three-year recovery there. Love Fort Sam. Um, The medical staff, the medical team that was there at the time, everyone is so incredible. So very thankful for those people there. And then you know, we ended up, he took his medical retirement, which is why I said at the beginning, you know, he took a bit of a different retirement. He did bring it home, but a bit of a different retirement. So he medically retired and we moved to Cape Coral, Florida then. So super long story. Sorry for taking so much time. Oh, no, no, no. That's okay. (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, that that was obviously a significant moment in, you know, in your life, but is that... I guess when was the first time that you realized that you were a military child? Because I'm pretty sure like before then you kind of knew. Do do you remember like 
the age or where you were when you're like, man, I'm not like normal kids. Yeah. So honestly, I was probably still like four or five um, and realizing I was a military child. And it was really just that, uh, you know, sense of pride Mm -hmm. because my dad had served. You know, like I said, I would flip through that scrapbook. Like every single time I could get my hands on it, I would flip through it. And I think it was just that sense of pride that I was able to walk into school and say, no, my dad did something greater. My dad, you know, even though he wasn't doing it right then and there and he was a, you know, corrections officer, Mm -hmm. I could still walk around with that pride saying my dad did something greater even from from four or five and then it really stuck with me obviously since and being separated from <laughs> yeah it, um, for a decade now uh after retirement you know i will yeah. forever be a military brat military child i love that yeah that's that's awesome though yeah so like four years old was your first memories and then do you did you feel like your family was different? You said you lived in Oklahoma. Like, what was that dynamic like? Was it a military town? Because you obviously know there's very, there's a very apparent difference with living in a military town and just yes. being a military family in a regular town. So, like, yeah, can you talk about, like, that experience? Yeah. So, because he was reserved, we were so far away. Our um, The closest – or his unit was 45 minutes away. So mm-hmm. – you know, just growing up in the suburbs, of, you know, it's it's crazy to think that uh, the life of a military family is so different when you're on not on a base, when mm-hmm. you're the transition to living on a base, it felt like home because I was the only military child in my school. You could like or I think there was one other. And the, the the thing I always say is I could walk into school crying, you know, because my dad wasn't there. My dad wasn't coming home. And everyone would look at me and be like, oh, but your dad is coming home. Like, you'll see him tonight. Like, you know, thinking that he works a nine to five. Yeah. And I'm like, it's not yeah. how this works. <laughs> you know, he's gone for the next month. Um, one of the big things was, I, I love school. Obviously, I am in a double master's program. You got to have some sort of passion for learning. Um, so I love school. I've always like first day of school and last day of school were viewed as holidays in my eyes. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when my dad had to go um, to reclass and he wasn't going to be there for my last day of school, that was heartbreaking for me. And so, you know, I just there's not many people who understood Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. the thoughts that I was having because yeah. I was a military child. So being on a base, it actually felt like home. And I felt like mm-hmm. I was understood and I could connect with everyone. Mm-hmm. And then um, especially with the traumatic situation we were facing, there were other kids who were facing similar situations and circumstances. Yeah. And then this is a whole other story, but the transition from military base to retirement sucked (laughs) like worst (laughs) transition ever especially for a child who is 12 years old I just missed the military life um even though my military life is kind of choppy um and a lot of people would be like yo you haven't lived that much of a military life like no I've seen some stuff you will never see (laughs) um but uh, taking me out of that was just a struggle, and I hated it here in Florida for three years. All I wanted to do was go back to Texas because that's what I knew of military life. Mm-hmm. And yeah, then I learned to love it. I learned to make friends and, you yeah. know, the whole nine yards. But yeah, it's definitely living near a military base and not living near a military base is it's a big thing. Yeah, it's a big, it's it's huge, especially when like your dad is deployed, right? Like you have right. that community where people understand what's going on. But with that, do you ever remember like being fearful of, like, did you understand what a deployment meant? It's it's so crazy because we were talking to our kids. I mean, you, you obviously know I'm dual active duty and I'm here yes. in Japan. But like we were talking to our kids like, hey, do you know what mom and dad do? It's pretty dangerous. Right. And they were just like like my older son knew 
but he was kind of like, but what do you mean, mom? So do you ever remember having that moment, like my dad does something dangerous that he may not come home? Oh, absolutely. I remember like laying in my bed at night. Um, Mm -hmm. My parents would, when they told us my dad was deploying, um, obviously I was so young that I didn't remember the first two deployments. Um, But uh, that, that, big deployment, um, I remember just laying in my bed um, at night, just wondering and worrying. And this wasn't even when the deployment was going on. It was before the deployment, like just being so anxious about Mm -hmm. what could happen, what would happen. And my parents, they just, they tried to make light out of the situation. We had just taken a big family trip to Disney World and it was really our first vacation as a family. Otherwise, other words from um, Kalahari, which my sister and I went for cheer competitions a lot, but that was, you know, a 45 minute drive up the street. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, we'd take like little short vacations um, to Kalahari, really. Mm-hmm. Um, but we had never really been out of the state. And so when we were excited to go to, to Florida, go to Disney, it was, it was, you know, a grand old time. And yeah. so, when my parents told us that dad was deploying, they're like, well, we're going to go to Disney world, you know, after his deployment. So kind of saying, Hey, you know, this is going to happen. This is scary. This is a hard time. This is going to be a long 400 days. But after that, we're going to go to Disney world. So we kind of had something to look forward to. I had something to make myself a little less anxious, less Mm -hmm. nervous. Um, But I was also nine. I had learned about 9-11. I had learned about war, you know, in school and um, these major moments in history. And I knew what could happen. I knew the potential. I was always a history nerd. So I'm like looking and researching. And um, even now you tell me one thing, I'm going to go research everything until I know Mm -hmm. um, and feel confident about the topic. But I I knew something could happen and I would just lay in bed wondering and worrying and, you know, at the same point that you can't necessarily do that. You kind of have to hit the the reset button every night and say, okay, my my dad or my husband, my mom, my wife, you know, might be deployed, might be gone, but I can't worry about what they're doing over there because I have to worry about you know, it's that whole home front service thing, serving on the home front. So right. out how you're going to keep the house running again. Like I was mm-hmm. the oldest child, so I had stepped up and to help my mom where I could. So, you know, you have to keep going. Yeah. And so while I was anxious, while I was nervous, while I knew what could happen, I knew he couldn't come home. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I also knew that I had to keep going. Yeah. So your dad, so you were what, nine years old, you said when he got out or when he got hurt? So he did. Okay. So he came back home. So, so you were nine when your dad got injured and then how old were you when he got out of the military, when he finally retired? I was 12. So we went through the whole recovery process and then he, he took his retirement then. Okay, so 12, and then you guys moved to Florida. So at any point, did you have aspirations of joining the military, or did that, like, thought ever come to mind? So for the the longest time, I kept saying, I will never join the military, because, you know, I'm seeing these guys come back. Fort Sam is a major, you know, military hospital. So I'm seeing these guys come back and and girls, you know, missing limbs, you know, 75-plus percent burned, like, seeing these these we were at the height of of afghanistan and yeah. you know iraq was you know kind of fading out at that point mm-hmm. we were at the height and so seeing all of these you know injuries that you'll you won't see walking around the streets as a civilian yeah. and so i'm seeing all of this and i'm like i'm never joining the military i'm never marrying military i'm never doing it like that's not happening i just mm-hmm. i can't i can't do that to myself i can't um, I think at one point I kind of had the thought of why did you do that? Why would I do this to my kids? Mm-hmm. Um, like I, I yeah. don't want to put them through that ever again. Um, I'm very thankful that I went through it. Um, <laughs> but you know, I was like, I'm never putting my kids through this. Like they mm-hmm. can't live this lifestyle, like all of these things. And then at one point, 
I wanted to, oh, actually, I remember we would drive around in Texas and we would drive past the, past the airport. And I'm like, I want to fly a plane. Like, I want to be a pilot. And my parents mm-hmm. are like, well, you're going to go to the Air Force Academy. You're going to go to Annapolis. Like, <laughs> they're going to pick you up right away. You're going to say you want to be a woman pilot. And mm-hmm. that's going to check every single box of theirs <laughs> and you'll be brought right in. And I said, um, I don't want to fly for the military. I want to fly for Southwest. Yeah. So, <laughs> um. Yeah. And they were like, okay, well, you can go fly for Southwest, but you have to fly for, you know, a few years in the military first. And Mm -hmm. so that kind of was like, okay, nope, not doing that. Um, At one point um, when I was looking at colleges, I believe I was in about 10th grade. um, I was looking at West Point. Mm -hmm. I want to be a political journalist. And so Mm -hmm. um, while it's still kind of an aspiration in me, I still (laughs) want to be a pilot too. Like I still have all of these dreams that I have to achieve, I feel. Mm -hmm. Um, But they were like, West Point is your best option. And so I kind of had more of an open mind at that point. So it still took a lot of convincing. um, And so I wanted to go to West Point. Mm -hmm. And then that faded away. I was like, nope, not doing it, not happening. Um, And then I kind of, the drawback from Afghanistan hurt me a lot. Um, that was where my dad got injured. That's where a lot of yeah. my friends, their family, um, you know, had ties. Um, their dads got injured there. And so it was just a hard period of time. Um, I didn't necessarily tell anyone. So when I say it now, they're like, oh, no, you did not. Um, yeah. I wanted to join. I was yeah. like, I, you know, I sat on the couch brought my little computer, my desk, my everything. I Mm -hmm. transplanted myself to the couch and I would just do all my work from there. And Mm -hmm. I was like, I glued to the TV watching everything unfold. And I just kept going, okay, well, if this is how it's going to be, like I'm, I'm joining, I'm going to do this myself. Um, And then that didn't happen. I was in the middle of college. So just you know, I knew it wasn't yeah. the best time, which is one reason I didn't say anything. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah. and my school didn't offer ROTC, so that was just not an option either. Mm-hmm. Um, not that I probably would have done it, but <laughs> it was not an option. So um, then I was in a relationship with a Marine. Um, okay. It was a very toxic relationship in the end of it. Um, we were engaged. We were getting married. And I wanted that lifestyle, you yeah. know. Said I was never going to marry military, and then I got a glimpse of it for about a year um, in the long distance aspect of it. Got that glimpse, and I was like, I want this lifestyle. I want this lifestyle so bad. After we broke up, it was, um, I think that portion of my life was meant to show me how much I love the military, how much I love mm-hmm. the life um at I was at a point in time where I was like I'm done with the podcast like I'm done podcasting like this is this is enough and then you know him and I got in a relationship and that's when I expanded it to include spouses and sharing the stories of spouses and so you know all of this stuff was happening and it all happened for a reason I can always go back and say everything happened for a reason but mm-hmm. um after I got out of that relationship I'm like where's my military connection where, you know, I have the podcast. I'm always going to be a military child, but I want something more. Mm -hmm. And so, um, in a sense, out of spite, I was like, I'm going to join the military. I'm going to join. I'm going to do all of this. And my parents were like, you really need to think this through. Like you, this out of spite. Like if you want to, like, we're going to support you hundred percent of the way. Um, and but you cannot do this like out of spite you can't be spiteful with it and so I went okay and I also have like I was a dancer for 12 years so my knees are like gone to begin with (laughs) my back is gone it would be hard to be in the military (laughs) um I had kept saying because he was a marine I was like I'm gonna join the marines it's the hardest branch I'm gonna do all this (laughs) they were like you need to really think this through. Like you really need to think this through. Um, My dad was like, I would support you, especially joining the Air Force or the Army. Um, Mm -hmm. Everyone told me Air Force. They were like, go Air Force. You have the education. You have the smarts. Like Air Force is for you, especially with my desire of wanting to be a pilot at some point still too. (laughs) They were like, Air Force. Um, That is not a path for me anymore, I don't think. Um, 
so joining myself kind of comes and goes. Um, mm-hmm. But I do want to be a military spouse. I do. Um, I would love the opportunity to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, I always say it's not fully my decision. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right. <laughs> if the time does come, if the right person comes along, um, I have people kind of on all ends of the country kind of keeping an eye out um, Mm -hmm. if they see somebody come around. Um, But, you know, I would love the option to be a military spouse and have that connection to the military community because Mm -hmm. I feel that as a child, you know, I'm kind of breaking that door a bit, but because I'm separated, there's the door is pretty closed. And so I feel like, you know, breaking that door, but, you know, as a spouse, there's so many more open doors to advocate for military families to be part Mm -hmm. of that community. So, and I'm very thankful for the community that I have built with the podcast because they have welcomed me in with open arms. Most of my friends are military spouses, but, Mm -hmm. you know, still, um, Long story short, sorry, I keep saying long stories, but no, no, no. That's, that's okay. That's okay. So yeah, I know you're, I know you're super passionate about a lot of things like military yeah. family related, but I want to ask you specifically about, um, I saw something you posted about healthcare for military children and I don't want to get it wrong. So I'm gonna let you explain. Do, do you know what I'm talking about? Yes, I do. Okay. So, okay. um, there is currently a bill, and because we've reset to 2024, um, I don't necessarily know the status of it. I need to kind of circle back around to it. But it's called the Healthcare Fairness for Military Families Act. Okay. Um, it was first introduced in 2021, did not go anywhere, and reintroduced in 2023. It did not go anywhere last year either, so it's going to have to be reintroduced and. The whole process started over again, unfortunately. Um, However, Mm -hmm. military children um, specifically, they, you know, are on TRICARE, you know, with their families for since they're since they're born. Um, And the health care, the Affordable Care Act um, was put into place in 2010, Mm -hmm. stating that parents must keep their children on or the insurance plan requires parents to keep their children on health insurance until the age of 26, no matter what. So you can be married. I could have had a child if I wanted, not that I wanted, but I could have had a child. I could have been married, had a child. I could be unemployed, whatever, until I'm 26. And then after I'm 26, I got to figure it out on my own. Try care, find a loophole. Mm-hmm. And so um, I don't know if they found it, if they, what happened, but there's a loophole. And so as a military child, you are kept on your parents' TRICARE insurance until the age of 21. And this mm-hmm. is like TRICARE specific. So you're kept on insurance until the age of 21. From 21 to 23, you can stay on. However, you have to be a full-time student in college, which is one big reason why I've continued my Continue. education. I've, you know, I'm an overachiever, so I've wanted to go back to school, but this is one um, incentive of going back to school is having insurance, having health care. Okay. And so after the age of 23, between 23 and 26, you are allowed to stay on TRICARE, your, your parents' insurance. However, you have to pay for TRICARE Young Adult. And TRICARE okay. Young Adult is like two to $500 a month. And so what young child graduating college in a trade school in, you know, trying to get, let me tell you, I am trying to get into the workforce (laughs) as a 21 year old, 22 year old, whatever, coming with a master's degree Mm -hmm. and experience. I have little experience, not necessarily master's degree equivalent experience, but I have Mm -hmm. some experience. So I'm coming with experience in education. And I'm either overqualified for entry level positions or underqualified for like management director positions. Mm -hmm. So it is really hard to get a job that's going to provide insurance. And so at this point, that's what I'm chasing is a job that can provide insurance. And so because, um, because of the, that's the way TRICARE is the healthcare for uh, healthcare fairness for military families act was introduced to try and reverse that to supplement 
um, you know, military families who are going through this. And so, like I said, it was introduced in 2021, didn't go anywhere, reintroduced last year. Um, I spoke to my senator's office. I've spoken to my congressman's office. And, you know, that's all you can do is you can keep calling and keep calling and keep calling. And, um, you know, hopefully they're going to get annoyed with you at some point and forward it up to D.C. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the same point, like, it's so unfair. I mean, it literally says it in the title of the bill. It's the Fairness Act. And so it's unfair to military families, to military children to have to move around for 18 years of your life, you know, or go through something as traumatic as I went through or every single story is different. So to go through what you've gone through in your parents' service than to be, you know, I don't want to say discriminated, but discriminated against with health insurance. So it's definitely a battle that a lot of kids are facing. I, you know, my friend, she, this is how quick they are. She graduated on a Saturday, 5 a.m. the next morning. She got an email from TRICARE saying she was done and she had to pay for young adult. And so she had to pay for young adult over the summer until her job kicked in and she had um, insurance from her job. So it is definitely something that is not fair. And it's something that a lot of people don't know about. I try to post about it pretty frequently just to, you know, get the word out there. Maybe the right eyes are going to catch it. Mm -hmm. But it's so surprising to me how many people don't know about it and how Mm -hmm. many people are going to get to that point where they're graduating college and 5 a.m. the next morning they get the email and say, hey, you're done. Like you have to afford for it or like you you have to pay this amount of money if you want insurance still. So yeah. it's definitely Jeez. something that military kids have to face, military families have to face. And unknowingly and after everything, you know, they've been through, gone through all of the service to the country because, you know, military families, we serve in a sense too. Um, you know, not like you do on the front lines, you know, being a service member, but, um, you know, we serve at home. And so, Um, there's definitely, um, room to grow and room to help military families a lot. Yeah, for sure. And I, I definitely have to get educated on that. But when I saw your post, um, you know, I did a little bit of like, I, I Googled some articles and I looked into it, but it really got me thinking about my kids, right? I have young kids now and my husband and I are close to 16 years of service. So it's like, And we've had the conversation like, hey, are we going to stay past 20, you know, to make sure the kids are good? Like, that's a real conversation that people are going to have. But, yeah, you definitely, like, enlightened me on (laughs) insurance (laughs) post-military service for, like, my kids, right? Yeah. Um, Yeah. So thank you for that that explanation. That was, like, really, really, really awesome. But um, you, you talked a little bit about, you know, starting your podcast and wanting to stop so how did how did you like how did your podcast come around um and I guess like what's your mission and where do you want to see this go yeah so late February early March so right around this time of the year three years ago 2021 um I would driving to college I lived 45 minutes away from my college so it was a commute um and I decided to live at home to save money um and so I would listen to podcasts on my way out there. Um, it was 45 minutes. That's about one podcast episode, depending on what podcasts you listen to. Mm-hmm. I would listen to podcasts on the way there, listen to music on the way back or vice versa. Mm-hmm. And so I would, came home and one day my mom looked at me and she goes, you should start a podcast. Wow. And I go, absolutely not. That's a great idea. But no, I was like, I cannot stand listening to myself talk. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't believe I'd be a good podcast host. Uh, all of this stuff. I came up with so many excuses. And then my sister and I, we were running errands that night. And she go, or I presented it to her. And she goes, you should do it. You can call it Grace of a Military Child. You know, my mom had said, you know, interview military children. I should mm-hmm. specify that. Um, mm-hmm. My sister was like, call it Grace of a Military Child. Kind of encompasses everything, how military children 
are graceful, you know, all of this stuff. It plays off of your name. And she's like, I'll draw you a logo once we get home. And I went, okay, looks like we're doing this. Yeah. And so um, my dad and I spent weeks researching microphones, researching setup, researching how to do recordings, all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. And so it just kind of really grew from there. My first couple of guests were my sister was on there. My friends were on there. And then, oh, my goodness, like I look at my Instagram today and I'm like, we're almost at 1500 followers. Like this is insane. This is mm-hmm. mind blowing to see the growth that we've had um, in just three short years. Yeah. And so there was a time in my life in um, – You know, so 2021, I started it. I launched April 1st, 2021, um, month of the military child. I was like, this is perfect timing. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I didn't want to rush myself. So I had about a month and a half to get it together, Mm -hmm. figure out what I was doing. My sister did all my graphic design work um, in the beginning. So if you scroll all the way back, that's all of her work. Um, And so we kind of just ran with it. And then later that year, I was employed by a dance studio and they, in a sense, kind of thought that that was taking a lot of my time. That was a lot of my time. A lot of my effort went to that. And I'm like, no, like I'm working, I'm going to school and I'm doing a podcast. Like my Mm -hmm. time is pretty evenly split um, Mm -hmm. where it should be. And so I was like, all right, well, I ended up quitting that job and I felt so unmotivated to do the podcast. You know, I was at a slow growth point at that moment. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't necessarily, I was a health science undergraduate major and I had not added my minor in marketing at that point. But Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, well, like I'm getting maybe one follower a month, like maybe one a week. Like this is just not growing. This is not going, you know, you see something hit viral and then it, blow up and you're like, oh my gosh, I want that. And that just wasn't happening. And so between being unmotivated due to what I was told at work and then that I was like, all right, I'm, I'm kind of just here for the ride now. Mm -hmm. So my dad kept scheduling me episodes. He would go on Facebook groups and say, Hey, my daughter has a podcast who wants to be on it. And, Mm -hmm. you know, got tons of people to be on it and all of this stuff. And, um, I was like, I just, i not motivated for this, not motivated for it anymore. And mm-hmm. so um, 2022, I got into the relationship with the Marine and was still pretty unmotivated. I remember telling him at the beginning, like, yeah, I'm trying to quit. Like, I don't, I'm not trying to do this. And then my mom was like, well, you'd be like spouse of the year for doing this. And I'm like, yeah. that's an achievement. Like I could get that. <laughs> like, And so that kind of gave me a little motivation to hold on for a little longer. And then once I really stepped into that role um, of being a military girlfriend of military fiance, I was like, no, this is something important. And, mm-hmm. you know, re- yeah. My motivation grew a lot from talking to spouses again and meeting with people like yourself and um, just hearing these stories and being so inspired by them by myself that I'm like, this is important. Like, let's keep it going. Yeah. So I just I've kept it going ever since. I took about a one, two month break, three month break. I took three month break when I broke up with him because I was mm-hmm. devastated. Um, that question ran in my head of, am I going to keep this going? Am I not going to keep this going? And I went, no, like going to keep this going one, because it could help me find a service member potentially, um, because I live nowhere near a military base, but, um, I was like, I'm going to just keep this going. I'm going to oh, keep I it can't going. hear you. Oh, can you hear me now? Oh, there you are. Okay. okay. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. I was like, I'm going to keep this going. I'm going to do this. I'm going to, like, I'm making a difference. And, you know, now three years later, you know, April 1st is the birthday. So, you know, yeah. now three years later, I'm like, this has made a difference. This has made an impact. And hearing the stories and then hearing the, the response of how, it feels from a child's perspective, especially I hear it from child um, children a lot of, we didn't get to tell our stories, you know, now we can. 
mm-hmm. and hearing from children who were around during World War II or Vietnam or Korea, like that's just, it's mind blowing hearing those stories. Yeah, I bet. No, that's awesome. And I think, yeah, you're definitely building a great community. And it's, it's so interesting because I think sometimes you just kind of forget, like the kids are along yeah. the ride, but it's like, hey, what, what, what are they doing? How is this affecting them? So yeah, like, thank you for like opening me up to a new like perspective being a military parent, right? Like there's a lot of things that I've realized like I need to focus on and talk to my children about. So yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's continue fun. to do it, please. please <laughs> I will. I have found my passion in it. Okay, and, okay. you know, hopefully that one day comes where I'm a military spouse and like I'll have like an even greater passion. Um, I don't, I don't know what that might be, but you know, yeah. right now I've, I've found exactly where I'm supposed to be. I've found my community. I found my people. I have friends that I've never met before, you know, all yeah. around the world. And so, um, I've learned that is exactly where I'm supposed to be. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So I guess as we close here, is there any advice I guess you would give, let's see, um, let's say like a nine to 12 year old and then an adult military child, like looking back on your life at that age and then where you're at now, like what advice would you give military children? So somebody around nine, 12 years old, I would say keep going. You know, it's going to be hard. It is going to be some of the hardest days of your life, but you know, keep going. You have to keep your head up. You have to keep fighting especially because that determination, that courage, you know, BRAT's an acronym, everything that it stands for, that bravery, resilience, adaptability, toughness, like that's all going to carry with you. You know, it made me who I am and Mm -hmm. I am so thankful for it. And so, um, you know, every time I talk to like somebody around that age, a younger child, I'm like, it might suck now, but you're going to look back and you're going to be so thankful for everything you went through. Um, so that's probably what I would say to someone around that age. Um, an adult military child, find your community. Because for me, no matter where you are, if you're that college age kid, like moving out and starting your own life or um, your parent had been retired for a decade before you turn or well, he was retired for about six, eight years. Either way, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, so if you're kind of separated from the military life, um, that's the hardest transition I ever faced. And so finding that community, finding those people, finding those people in the military community, finding other military kids. And sometimes you have to search for them, but it's so important to have somebody who knows what you've been through, who knows what you go through because a civilian, you can't walk up to them and say, Hey, yeah, no, my dad, um, you know, deployed and they would understand. Um, not necessarily, I don't think it's intentionally, but I get the sob story a lot. Like, Oh my gosh, we're so sorry. We're, you know, we're so sorry you went through this. Like, you know, we just, we have so much pity for you. And I'm like, no, like, let's not, because I don't have that for myself. Um, I had it for at one point and it did not work out very well. Mm-hmm. So yeah. um, let's focus on what it did, how it changed me, how it made me better and go from there. So finding your community, especially as an adult military child, as an adult in any sort of military family capacity, you know, that is the most important thing. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That's, that's great advice. Thank you for that. Um and now, yeah, let's let everyone know how we can support you. Where where can we find you, email you, follow you, um, set up interviews if we're interested? Yeah, let us, yes. let us know all the details. Yeah, so um, my main platform is Instagram. That's where I'm, I'm just an Instagram person. It's my generation. So yeah. <laughs> um, you can find me on Instagram at grace of a military child and life, all one word. Um, or I'm also on Facebook and YouTube. Um, I, I air all of my podcast episodes on YouTube, both the audio and video versions, so you can mm-hmm. see them there. Um, if you were on prior to 2024, your video is not on there. I just started doing it. <laughs> um, but uh, all the videos are on there. Um, so you can 
Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn too, which is fun. Um, but Instagram is the main point. And then I also have a website. It's called G-O-A-M-C-L dot org. So the abbreviation of Grace of Military Child and Life. And then you can email me at Gracie dot. Sorry. Nope. Not that one. <laughs> Gracie at G-O-A-M-C-L dot org. Um, And then there's also an email button on Instagram. So if you go to Instagram, you can take you you right to my email. Or there's a link tree on there as well, which will take you to my website. It'll take you to my other platforms. Um, There is a Calendly link on there that you can schedule episodes. There's also a Calendly link on my website where you can schedule episodes. Um, Or you can always DM me. You know, my DMs are always open. So I try to get back to everyone within an hour. (laughs) Most of the time it happens. So, Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for taking time. I know you're super busy and and (laughs) like you're more than 10 years older. I'm more than 10 years older than you. So when I see you, I'm like, oh my God, this girl is, <laughs> you're going places. So keep on keeping on. But yeah, thank thanks so you. much for taking time um, and good luck with all your endeavors. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Yeah. And I will link all of Gracie's information in the show notes. So thanks for hanging out with us today, guys. And we'll catch you in the next entry.